And we are joined by a very special guest, Warren Buffett. And Mr. Buffett, thank you for joining us this morning. Good to be here. It's great to see you. And uh, we couldn't think of a better time to have you on because there are so many questions about what's been happening with the economy, what's been happening with the jobs picture. Um, why don't you tell us what you're seeing right now in your businesses? Well, I've got a little different story this time. Than, uh, uh, for a couple of years, I've been telling you that everything except residential housing was improving at a moderate rate, not not uh, not crawling, uh, but not galloping either. And but that residential housing was flatlining, and and the last two months it's been just sort of the opposite. The uh, uh, the general economy in the United States has been more or less flat, and and uh, uh, it, so the the growth is tempered down. But the residential housing uh, uh, we're seeing a pickup, and it's it's noticeable. It's from a very low base and. You know, it doesn't amount to a whole lot yet, but uh, but it's getting better, and uh, so you've got you've got kind of got a flip flop on that. And uh, well, what happened? I, I, when we talked in the past, you had said when housing turned, that would be when the U.S. economy would turn. What yeah, happened? Well, it hasn't turned that much yet, but it's it, it is picking up. But but at the same time, uh, the rest of the economy, I would say, is, is slowing down. It's not it's not heading downward, but but it's but it's 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 not it's not growing at the rate that it was earlier. And then it's kind of interesting in Europe. For a year or so, in most places, I mean, forget about Greece for the moment, but generally in Europe, uh, you didn't have a big slowdown. You had a lot of worry and all of that. Uh, but in the last couple months in Europe, particularly in the last month, uh, it, it's pretty much across Europe. Uh, things have really started to slip pretty fast. We've heard this from a lot of CEOs who have joined us in the last several weeks, but uh, what business lines in particular do you look at and, and do you see these things kind of popping well, up? Well, I, I look at all of the businesses we have and then I talk to people in other businesses and, and uh, uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear that that's what's going on right now. It, uh, uh, there are certain figures I can't tell you where I get them, but, but they... Uh, uh, Europe is really, uh, uh, it's, it's headed downward uh, in the last, I don't know, six weeks or so. And, 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 uh, uh, and it wasn't going that way before. It wasn't doing that well, but it, was, but it wasn't hitting, it, it hadn't really hit the skids. Is that because of consumers or because of businesses? Uh, confidence really slowing down and, and spending slowing down? Yeah, well, spending slowing down. And, and when spending slows down, uh, business reacts. I mean, they, 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 uh, they're not seeing the same kind of spending, so they're they pull in their horns some. What, um, of, of the things that you can talk about, the numbers that you do see concern you the most? Well, it, it's, it's pretty general, uh, Becky. I mean, like I say, it, hasn't, it has not turned down in the United States. I mean, our freight car loadings are up week by week. I, I normally get them today, but I'm not mm -hmm. uh, home. So, I, but last week, uh, you know, they're up. Although the Eastern railroads were down uh, moderately. Uh, a lot of that's coal, but nevertheless, just across the board, whether you're looking at our retail sales and jewelry or furniture or you name it, uh, uh, yard, yards of carpet are down. Our carpet business is better. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the other hand, if you look at, we're the largest home builder in the country, Clayton Homes, and mm -hmm. that's up. Brick is picking up, but these are from low levels. But you are seeing uh, in our real estate brokerage firm, which is the second largest in the country, pending sales. Uh, are up by a reasonable amount, but from a very low base. Well, with everything else, with the uh, this, uh, you know, not a, a, a reversal, but a, a slowdown in the growth. Wh what happened? What, what happened six weeks ago to, to spook people, to spook businesses? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I just I know I know the result. Uh, you can argue in Europe uh, why it was delayed so long. I mean, it, it, because it. Europe has really been, you can see this coming for two, it was two years ago we sold all our Spanish and Italian and, and uh, even French bonds. Uh, I mean, we're overly cautious probably, but, but that was two years ago. So Europe, with all this going on, it, 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 it probably kept it from having any kind of uh, uh, gains, but it didn't, it didn't really seem to sink in. Uh, but I would say the last, well, I know the last couple of months, and with some acceleration, it's probably, it's been hitting over there. We've watched the jobs picture and the last unemployment, the last unemployment numbers at 8.2% uh, from that last big government report last Friday. Is that a chicken and egg cycle? What I mean, are people watching the jobs number and getting spooked by it, or is the jobs yeah. number kind of? Well, you're, you're right. I mean, there is some circularity to it, but yeah. uh, 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 
I, I don't know the answer uh, as to exactly why it's happening. And I, and I don't know what it'll be three months from now or six months ago, from now, because three months ago, I didn't know what it would be today. So, uh, and the U.S. economy is doing better than virtually any big economy around the world. Uh, I mean, it, it, this economy has come back a long way, with the exception of housing, from where it was a few years ago. And, and you, you can see it in corporate profits. And, uh, but uh, it, I thought it would take housing, I still think it would take housing coming back significantly to move us generally significantly upward. And I still think that's true. But so far, the little pickup in housing has not been uh, near enough to offset whatever's going on in the, in the world generally. The Fed came out with their minutes yesterday, and obviously they're concerned about the economy. They say that they could step in to do something else, but I guess the question becomes, what would it take to get them to step in, and what could they do at that point? Yeah, I, I have my own doubts. I'm sure Chairman Bernanke would disagree with me, and he knows a lot more about it than I do. But I, I don't, I, you know, when you, get, when you have interest rates down to, to zero, not only here, but in the, main, in the major countries in Europe, and and you have the, you have a 15-year Treasury inflation uh, protected so-called tips security selling at a negative yield. Mm -hmm. 15 years, people are willing to put their money out at a minus rate uh, 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 in real terms. That, that 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 that's about as far as you can go. I, I, now I, I'm you know you can talk about more easing or that sort of thing, but. Uh, you know, the banks are sitting with enormous amounts of money at the Fed. They don't want to be sitting with that money at the Fed. I mean, it, it's, it's bringing them a quarter of a percent or so. You lose money on that money at the Fed from the bank standpoint. So they're not happy having that money at the Fed. They just aren't seeing that much demand for, uh, for loans. So, Although they're picking up a little, I mean, uh, but it's uh, nothing like uh, uh, people would like to see. I, I, don't see. I don't see what the Fed does that's, that, that's dramatic. Is, does that mean we're in a wait and see pattern? And to some extent. And, and it, it, it also means that, that, that uh, <laughs> they shouldn't be bicycling like crazy at the Fed while, while uh, uh, well, it, it, they, they may, maybe they should be bicycling like crazy, but, it, but while Congress sits there on the sidelines and, and you know, and, and uh, basically squabbles. What should Congress be doing at this point? I mean, we're going to talk more with Simpson and Bowles a little later this morning, but you think that there's something that Congress should be doing right well, now? Well, I think, I think people have a feeling that, that, that Congress is, is inept and, and, uh, and, and sort of paralyzed by, uh, by the desire of each side to make the other side look bad. So I, I, I think that has got to be a factor in, in, in general confidence. Uh, uh, you know, if you see your government not functioning, it's not, it's not really the most, it's not the biggest spur to activity that you can imagine. Yeah, maybe not a confidence booster, so yeah. to speak. So, so I, I, think, I think it's hard for the Fed to offset the Congress in terms of changing public opinion. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have more with Warren Buffett in just a moment. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to a special edition of Squawk Box. We are live in Sun Valley, and we are joined by Warren Buffett. And Mr. Buffett, well, let's get back to what we were talking about sure. with Europe before. Uh, the spreads blew back out again, and all of the fixes we thought we'd seen from the ECB, at, at this point, they seem to be lasting for less and less time, um, back above 7% for some of these bonds. What's this mean? Where, where are we well, headed? Well, it means that, that uh, a fundamentally flawed system was designed some years back, and we've been trying to, or they have been trying to patch it during the last couple of years, and and uh, uh, it's hard to change a, a very fundamental, important system with patches, particularly when 17 people have a say in where the patches should go and what kind of patches you should use. So it's 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 not an easily solved problem. Well, at this point, as you mentioned, it's really hurting the economy there as well, starting to drag down in, in a major way. Particularly in the last few months, yeah. So what's the end result over the next six months or so? Well, 10 years from now, Europe will be working fine, but they, 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 but the, and people will be consuming more there. They'll, they'll get it worked out, but, but there is no obvious answer, and, and, uh, and that becomes more and more apparent as they go along. And, and, like I say, they're, they're trying to put patches on something that's got a lot of leaks. <laughs> but uh, patches on something that has a lot of leaks, you could have a lot of different solutions to the end of that. Is the euro still going to exist 10 years from now? Europe will, but will the euro? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't think they know. I mean, it, it, it certainly can't exist as originally designed. Uh, we've found out that, that trying to have a common monetary unit when you don't have somewhat 
common fiscal policies and cultures and work rules and all kinds of things. Uh, it just doesn't work. And, and uh, uh, how, they'll, how they'll resolve that is anybody's guess. Obviously, it, it depends on who's in charge, who the leaders are, yep. and leaders there seem to get voted out every time um, a new election comes along. Yeah. So if there's a constant changing set of players at the table, how how is there a good solution? Yeah, well, I, 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 I would not know the solution myself. I mean, Henry Kissinger said a long time ago, you know, if I want to call Europe, what number do I dial? <laughs> and, and, you know, essentially that's the problem. I mean, that, that when we had our crisis in 2008, everybody knew the responsibility was on Bernanke and, and Paulson mm -hmm. and, and with the president behind them. And uh, as, long as, as long as they knew where they were going, they had the will and the, and, 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 and the ability to do things that were needed to do. But exactly who has the ability, uh, when, when you don't have a printing press, you, uh, it, it's, it's a different animal. You know, we, we've been watching the headlines over the last several weeks, and the manipulation of LIBOR is just the latest in a series of scandals uh, that has to break down the public's trust in what happens with financial institutions, what happens on Wall Street. What do you think about what's happened with LIBOR? And how big of a deal is this? Well, it, it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I mean, it, you know, you've got the base rate for the whole world, <laughs> including, including some uh, loans we have in, mm -hmm. in the past. And uh, so uh, and the idea that a bunch of traders can, can uh, start emailing each other or phoning each other and, 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 play, and play around with that rate is, is, is an important thing. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it is not good for the system. Does it shake your confidence in the system? Well, I, I've got a lot of confidence in the system over time. I know the, our system works. I mean, you know, we are sitting here in Sun Valley in pretty good circumstances compared to a couple hundred years ago. So uh, we're, we're not working any harder than people worked 200 years ago. We're not any smarter, but we, we live far differently. So our, our system works over time, mm -hmm. but, but uh, it sure shakes, <laughs> shakes your faith in certain institutions, I'll put it that way, not the, but not the whole system. But, uh, I know Andrew's got a question well, for you uh, as well. I, I oh, just, before, Andrew's going to talk ahead. about J.P. Morgan. I just, Warren, wanted to quickly ask. But Bob Diamond, very good executive. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that in the past, uh, you know, with Goldman had some PR and some, you know, some ethics issues. You said, I mean, you wouldn't want you. I don't think you wanted uh, Blank Fine to lose his job. I don't know what you wanted to happen with the the officers at Walmart. And I'm wondering whether you thought that this is an overshoot that that Diamond is just uh, unceremoniously dumped. And you know, he was an American in. Uh, in London, and I, I mean, would you don't wouldn't you rather have him stay if you were a Barclays shareholder? Well, I'm not a Barclays shareholder, but I, <laughs> I I don't think he had any choice but to go. When something as big as LIBOR, uh, you know, if it happened, and he wasn't in charge of all of Barclays at that time, but but uh, there are a lot of things that went on in that trading room uh, that uh, uh, who knows who was aware of what. Uh, and I don't know anything specific about it, but yeah, right. but uh, that was not that, it was not a rogue trader. Let's put it that way. You don't have different opinions based on whether you own shares in the stock, though, right? Well, I, I, no, not on this, but I, I, I may know less <laughs> about it because I, sometimes I maybe I haven't, yeah. I, haven't, I, haven't yeah. I haven't followed Barclays. <laughs> All right, you know, at Solomon, at Solomon, at Solomon, we had we had you know some problems, and and they had to go. Right, yeah. uh, Warren, talking about trust uh, and a company that you do own a stock in, J.P. Morgan. Uh, we're going to hear. From going to try to hear some more about what happened to that soured trade. Uh, your views on, on the trade itself, uh, your confidence in the company, your confidence in Mr. Diamond. Yeah, I, I think Jamie Diamond is one of the best bankers in the world. And uh, if I had a bank, uh, I, I like John Stumpf a lot too, incidentally, at Wells Fargo. But if, if, if I owned a bank at Omaha and I could get J, Jamie to, uh, to run it for me, I would feel very happy. And uh, no, Jamie, Jamie understands banking, he understands risk. and, and uh, you know, it was, it's a significant loss, but you, you, uh, J.B. Morgan lost right. billions and billions and billions of dollars on loans. I mean, if, you, if you've got a couple trillion dollar balance sheet, you're going to have some losses someplace. Do, do you have any different views as a result of this about the VOCA rule or some of the regulations that are part of Dodd-Frank? Well, I, I, I do. My partner, Charlie Munger, is more Old Testament than I am on this, but I, I do think that, uh, uh, I think there are good reasons to restrict the activities that banks can be in. 
So, so the activities that led to these losses, you would preclude J.P. Morgan from participating I, in, in the future? Well, it, it's, it, it's hard to say what they, those activities, I mean, if they're truly hedging risks, uh, you know, I, I, there's, there's certainly a lot to be said. Uh, if, if you're running a bank and you, you, you want to hedge interest rate risk, hedge foreign exchange risk, I mean, that, that, that's perfectly proper. We, we do it in our, in our energy companies. Uh, we, we, have, we have transactions all the time to hedge risk. So if somebody goes off the reservation and, and starts uh, uh, turning hedging positions into speculative positions, you know, you may have a problem. But that, that was not policy at J.P. Morgan. That, you know, that was one fellow as near, near as I can ascertain that, that, that went very, very big in a position that was originally designed as a hedge position. And, and then he put a hedge on a hedge and, and uh, pretty soon he had what they call a Texas hedge. <laughs> Hey, Warren, can we go back to LIBOR for a moment, sure. too? You mentioned that you have some contracts and some some things that are based off of sure. LIBOR that have been there, I'm, I'm guessing derivatives and some other things that have been in that? Well, uh, yeah, we, we own some auction rate uh, municipals, for example, that right. are priced off LIBOR, uh, a couple billion. So what happens? If, if LIBOR was manipulated, do you have a case to go back and have a complaint, to have a, a lawsuit, to have anything that comes up with any of this? Well, I, I think... There certainly will be your lawyers that will think that, and and uh, if if you can pin down the person that did something to you, and they had, uh, had uh, uh, there may well be some kind of a case. I mean, we we bought these securities in the market auction rate uh, municipals that have a that are tied to LIBOR. Uh, uh, I have a feeling that in for any one entity, the amount. Might be very, very small, but so but, it, but it's a huge, mar oh, it's a huge market. I mean, there's not, it, 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 it's the, the numbers would stagger you. So, how big of a problem could this turn out to be down the road? It could I turn mean, out to be a big problem, but we don't know what banks did what at this point. But uh, but uh, well, go back to our Solomon experience. You had one fellow with one bo couple of bond issues, and uh, it, that caused a lot of trouble. And and you get LIBOR, and you're talking about the whole world. Right, and everybody associated everything with it. Everything is everything's tied, and of course you're in this terrible position if you if you have millions of contracts based on LIBOR, and one side profits from a given price being out of line, and the other side loses. Uh, you're not going to collect from the fellow that got the benefit, and if you're in the middle of the trade, you're just going to have the people on the losing side of each trade uh, come after you. So it, it it's very asymmetrical for the person that's got a bunch of trades on. Okay, so it could be a potentially huge can of worms. It's, it, it is a can of worms. <laughs> it is a can of worms. It's a, it is a can of worms. <laughs> okay. uh, Warren, we're going to have much more in just a moment. We want to thank you for your time. We are in Sun Valley, as you mentioned, and we are joined by our dream lineup this morning. Warren Buffett, who's been with us for the last half hour, and joining us and sitting down with us right now are former Senator Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles, the former chief of, chief of staff for President Clinton. Uh, these are two gentlemen we have been hoping to get on the program for an incredibly long time uh, because of Simpson Bowles, Bowles Simpson, and everything that's happening with the fiscal cliff. So, gentlemen, we want to thank you very much for agreeing to sit down with us this morning. Um, Warren. Warren Buffett can attest to this, but when we go around and talk to CEOs, it is almost universal among them when they say, if they had a chance and could vote for Bull Simpson or Simpson Bowles, uh, they would put this in immediately and they can't understand why this hasn't happened already. Uh, Warren, That's not, not limited to CEOs either. I mean, it's not I, limited you know, to CEOs. I think if you, I, but I think if you poll Fortune 500, CEOs, I, I, you know, it'd certainly be 80 percent, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was 90 percent that uh, not only think it should be done. I mean, they think these fellows are heroes, and so do I. Yeah, and what uh, we'd like to say is, first of all, thank you for the work you've already put into this point, and ask you what you think can happen because the fiscal cliff is coming. It's a huge issue. Uh, to this point, no one's listened to your advice or taken it up, taking you up on this. How much more desperate of a situation are we now than when you first came out with your proposal? This is, these two, here I am, uh, these are the numbers guys, I do the color. Now, <laughs> Erskine can tell you, but let me tell you, this is, this is a giant among pygmies on this kind of thing. This, people are not dealing with it. He, he really strung the original package together with his patience and his brilliance because he's the last guy that ever was involved in balancing the budget so ship him out a little news there on that. <laughs> I'm not saying anything it doesn't get any better oh no, no. <laughs> well, well let me let me say something about these two because they 
they, they sat down with Republicans and Democrats and they were given a charge to come up with a plan that got, the, got it down to 3% of GDP and they got it down below that. They got a majority of the Republicans to vote for it. They got 11 out of 18. Uh, they did exactly what they'd been asked to do and they came up with a plan. No plan is perfect. You know, everybody can come up with a little different one, but everybody knows that we need something done and they, you know, they did their job and, and uh, Congress has not done its job. We got some hope, you know. It's uh, I think if I had to tell you uh, the probability, I'd say the chances are we're going over the fiscal cliff, and I hate to say it, but I think that's probably right. Uh, but we've worked hard to try to to get common sense to overrule politics, and that's a tough thing in Washington, as Al can tell you. But we've been around uh, the Senate and the House. We probably have as many as 45 to 47 senators, equal number of Republicans and Democrats who are in support of our efforts. We've got about 150 House members, again, relatively equal. Uh, we put together a CEO Fiscal Leadership Council, which is has over 100 Fortune 500 CEOs who are actively working to try to influence Congress to do something that makes just plain common sense. And we've got a social media campaign that we're working on where we hope to get uh, about 10 million signatures of people around the country to tell Congress, come on, let's put partisanship aside and let's pull together and let's face this uh, enormous fiscal problem that we have coming up. With all that on your side, why do you think that the odds are we do go over the fiscal cliff? Because it's politically painful. Uh, it's really tough for me to get beat. And it's not going to get less it's not going to get less painful in the future. That's the other thing about yeah. it. I mean, you know, if, if you had some kind of a disease, you might not want to have somebody open you up and, and yeah. cure it. But if you knew it was going to get worse next week, next month, next year, you know, you'd, you'd face reality. Yeah, the problem's real. The solutions are all painful and there's no easy way out. And but I was talking, Warren, a couple of weeks ago to American University's graduates and I just threw away what I was supposed to say. And I said, I said, they ought to be mad at us, at our generation, for shirking our responsibilities and kicking the can down the road. We've got to face up to this. I mean, this is our generation's problem, and we've got to fix it. Senator, you've been criticized for coming out and speaking your mind on some of these topics. <laughs> if I could do it with less uh, earthiness, it would be good. Well, no, 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 give us a little earthiness. I, I'm waiting for that. Uh, no, I know you do. You baited me. I've known this fine gentleman for years. He says, tell me that joke about the coast is clear. I, yeah. I do tell it to him, but I, I do. It's frustrating for me. Uh, you're in politics, and, and, and I loved it. You're entitled to be called a fool, boob, idiot, screwball, and all that, but never let them distort who you are. <laughs> and when people try to nail me with being a bigot or, uh, you know, a guy that hates veterans and hates seniors and the Cat Food Commission, that just steams me, and I, I respond. And they'll say, are you thin-skinned? I said, hell yes. <laughs> but I don't, I, I just, I just punch back, and I've never lost an election because an attack unanswered is an attack believed. And when people lay that stuff on me that's distorting my persona, I fire back. And I could do it, but I grew up with irrigators, and they had a terrible <laughs> vernacular. Well, what's, uh, what's your joke about the coast is clear? It's oh, very, <laughs> no, it's very quick. Uh, this couple hit the sack. This is a Wyoming story. A couple hit the sack. Three in the morning, the phone rings. Guy answers, says, how the hell do I know that's 2,000 miles from here? Hangs up. His wife said, who was it? He said, I don't know. He said, some nut called and asked if the coast was clear. <laughs> okay. He's just warming up, folks. Okay. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> and Mr. Bulls, you're the numbers guy. Why don't you tell us how bad this problem is when we do go over this fiscal cliff? Oh, look, I think the, that if we don't get these politicians to come together and we face the most predictable economic crisis in history, I think it's absolutely clear that uh, the fiscal path we're on is not sustainable and for me the best analogy is these deficits are like a cancer and over time they will destroy the country from within. Here's an easy way to understand it from a math viewpoint. Mm -hmm. If you take last year 100% of the revenue that came into the country, mm -hmm. every nickel, every single dollar that came into the country last year was spent on our what's called mandatory spending and interest on the debt. 
mandatory spending is principally the entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. What that means is every single dollar we spent last year on these two wars, national defense, homeland security, education, infrastructure, high value added research, every single dollar was borrowed and half of it was borrowed from foreign countries. That is crazy, crazy. It's a formula for failure in any organization. And right now we are faced with the benefit of incredibly low interest rates. What happens as interest rates start to climb? We're, we're spending right now $250 billion a year on interest at these incredibly low rates. That's more, to put it in perspective, than we spend at the Department of Commerce, Education, Energy, Homeland Security, Justice, Interior, and State combined. And if interest rates were at their average level in the 1990s or the first decade of this century, we'd be spending over $650 billion. Senator, Warren Buffett has, has said that part of this is the problem that Congress didn't act on this and didn't pick it up, but the president also didn't act and didn't follow up with what he had set out. Who do you blame for where we are right now? Well, we try to stay away from the blame game yeah. uh, because uh, people will often say, how did we get here? It's easy how we got here. We were told to bring home the bacon for the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. Go get the highway, go get me some money, go get raise this, do this, do this. And you got reelected by bringing home the bacon, mm -hmm. and now the pig is dead. But let me tell you what happened. He, the president, would have been torn to bits. His base would have said, you, you, you are dealing with entitlements. You're dealing with Medicare, and you promised you'd never hurt we poor seniors and never do anything to all this vulnerable population. Well, you know, that was his promise. And anything he would have done at that time would have been rejected unanimously by Republicans. If he had said, I'm for this, it would have gone to the House or the Senate, and they would have said, well, if he's for this, boy, we're going to nail him and just vote against it for no other reason than that. So that in other words, stick. we cannot do politics as usual. This has to be a whole new way of, of looking at the situation. Uh, and, and one of our members, Dick Durbin, give him a lot of credit. Yeah. I mean, here, Durbin voted for this and Tom Coburn, Tom two, two fine, splendid men with totally different ideology and philosophy on politics. And Durbin kept saying, where's the tipping point? And that's the key, because when the tipping point comes and the guys who give us money want more money for their money, if inflation will kick in and, 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 and in all these things and interest. And guess who will be hurt the worst? The little guy mm -hmm. that everybody talks about day and night. What fakery, what phoniness. Well, I'll tell you what, when we come back, we have to slip in a quick break here, gentlemen, but when we come back, we're going to talk about some solutions, some of the specifics that you laid out, and get into some of those details. Welcome back, everybody. Let's get straight back to our conversation with uh, our three newsmakers of the hour, Warren Buffett, Alan Simpson, Erskine Bowles. Uh, gentlemen, we had just been talking about the problems, but let's start talking about some real solutions, what needs to happen. And I know there are a lot of different ways to get to the numbers, but the basic number is, Warren, something you've talked to us about a lot on this program. What do you need to get for revenue? What do you need to get yeah, for you, spending? You, you, you know, Two and a half percent is, if that's average of GDP, is it? That actually is sustainable. The debt to GDP will not go up over time, and in all likelihood, with that. And these gentlemen were charged with bringing it down to three percent, and they came came in, I think, at two point two percent or something of the sort. So you have to get expenditures, in my view, down to about twenty one percent of GDP, and you have to get revenues up to eighteen and a half or nineteen. And and you could get hundreds of people that could draw up plans, thousands. Uh, that I would accept, he would accept, uh, and th they wouldn't all be identical, but it, it, it's such an obvious problem. The needed solution is so obvious, and most of the aspects of the solution are pretty obvious to everybody. And they, you know, you can argue around the edges. And uh, uh, the Democrats don't want to talk about reducing expenditure. They want to talk about reform. And the Republicans don't want to talk about revenues. They want to talk about reform. <laughs> I mean, reform is the is is, is the cop out word. <laughs> we, we've seen that. I know. I know your plan, gentlemen, had six points or six basic parts that lays out. A huge part of it is tax reform. And people that we've talked to, I think, spin it in different directions. They use tax reform as their code for doing whatever they want to do. Your plan was not uh, revenue neutral. It was to raise revenue and to do that how. What what we wanted to do was, first of all, in order to stabilize the debt 
and get it on a downward path as a percent of GDP, you've got to have at least $4 trillion of deficit reduction. So that's kind of like your bogey. So if you talk about anything less than that, you're just kidding yourself. What we said is, look, let's take a trillion of that from revenue and $3 trillion from spending cuts. And how did we get to revenue? What we said is what makes the most sense is to broaden the base, simplify the code, uh, start off with getting rid of all of, these, of this backdoor spending in the tax code. We only raised last year $1.3 trillion in total tax revenue coming into the country. And you know why? Because we had $1.1 trillion worth of spending in the tax code. Wow. You know, it's literally crazy. And if you would eliminate that, okay, you could take rates to 8% up to $70,000, 14% up to $210,000, have a maximum rate of 23%. You could take the corporate rate to 26%, and you could pay for a territorial system so all of that $1.5 trillion that's captured overseas could be brought back here. And if you just used 8% of that money from eliminating that supposed tax expenditures, so you're using 92% of it to reduce rates, 8% mm -hmm. is about $100 billion a year. That over 10 years is $1 trillion. That's where our run $1 trillion of revenue comes from. So no, it's not revenue neutral by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to have about a trillion dollars of revenue. And the reason you have to have that is if you take it all out of cuts, you'll truly hurt the disadvantage or you'll disrupt a very fragile economic recovery or you won't have enough to invest in education, infrastructure, and high value added research, what we need to invest in to grow the economy. Gentlemen, I know Andrew Ross Sorkin has a question as well. Andrew? Hey guys, uh, the question I had, and we had Paul Krugman on the, on the program yesterday, um, and there's been, you know, depending on which side of the aisle you come from, uh, you can like this plan and you can say that, there, or, or, or rather you can dislike this plan and say that the tax cuts are too harsh or they're too much or this or that. Um, he, he said that this proposal was, quote, regressive. Um, and I'm curious how, how both of you think about that critique. Well, you know, Paul Krugman uh, is a little hyper. Um, and uh, <laughs> when, when this started for me, he said that I would uh, never saw a spending cut I didn't love or some snide little crack, but I think he needs to rest. He needs, <laughs> he needs some solace. He needs to sit in Sun Valley and someone hold his hand and say, poor, poor dear. Alan, Alan. You're just getting he, into he, ranting. He yeah. had a really, really, really tough weekend. Uh, I, I guess he, he spoke to, the, to, uh, to, to a Spanish, I guess the guy from the Austrian School of, of Economics, and it's all over. Check it out on the web. But apparently, um, it didn't go so well uh, for the eminent uh, Mr. Krugman uh, with this guy. He, I don't know. It, uh, check it out. You might, you might enjoy it from, uh, from the sound of your tone. Yeah, you, you yeah. All, Joe, you also might tell him to check the, the analysis that we had done. And we tried to make sure that as we reform the tax code, we kept it just as progressive as it is today. And how, how did you do that? How did you ensure by going back? I mean, there are things like you get rid of second home mortgage interest deduction, you cap it at $500,000. Those are all things that are designed to help people at the bottom. Actually, well, if, you, sure. if you look at it, Becky, you know, only 27% of the people itemize. 73% mm. of the people don't even itemize, so they don't take advantage of a mortgage interest deduction. So and so what we said is, well, you can tell. From the 12.5% non-refundable tax credit, that helps the little guy. I mean, Paul Krugman talks about the little guy all day long. The little guy will be wiped out with, with and, and stimulus. I mean, I get a kick out of this. They say, well, we can get ourselves out of this with consumer spending. What consumer is ready to spend in this atmosphere? Right. I mean, this is madness. Yes, and a yeah. stimulus, you're not going to get a nickel's worth of stimulus from either party or they will go home and get cremated. We got a $1.3 trillion stimulus right now. We're spending $1.3 trillion more than we take in. Yeah, yeah, but we've got <laughs> right. a huge stimulus, right. just to just call that. And right. these guys are not talking radicalism. Right. I mean, for, for 50 years after World War II, more or less revenue was in the 18 and a half or so percent range and spending was in the 20 and a half percent range and it, and it really worked quite well. So this is not something the country is, you know, we're not talking about something we've never attained or anything of the sort. It's just that we, 
drifted into the situation where we're not getting enough revenue and we've overpromised on expenditure. We got we've got a rich country, but a rich country can overpromise. We've never yeah. had less revenue coming into this country since the Korean War. 15.2% of GDP. What who who is fooling who in this game? Mm -hmm. It's madness. It's numbers. It's math. We don't do wizardry. We do math. All right, gentlemen, we have some more numbers that are coming right after this. Jobless claims that are coming up. We'll get you those numbers, and then we'll be back with more with a special conversation from Sun Valley. Stick around. Squawk will be right back. We've been talking an awful lot about solutions, and gentlemen, you just heard the jobless claims number. Better than expected news, 350,000, but if you look at the unemployment picture and the last monthly jobs number, obviously there's some very concerning things happening here. When we have unemployment at 8.2 percent, how much tougher does it take for people to start talking seriously about these uh, these measures to try and help us? Austerity is, is a very tough thing to put on people when you're looking at numbers like this. Well. They're talking seriously around the country. Where, where you need them talking seriously is in Washington. And I, I mean, just as w one example, I, uh, everyone knows that you're going you're to have to change the uh, the debt limit. And mm -hmm. and and in my view, if you got two liters from each house, they should get it done in five minutes. I mean, it, it it it's going to be done. And why spend weeks posturing about that and huffing and puffing and accusing the other side of bad faith and all that? Just just raise it and get on to the next problem. <laughs> uh, you know, I would think that you could get Reed and McConnell and Pelosi and Boehner, and they just say we're, we're going to raise it. So why should we go through this charade of everybody blaming each other they've about this? They've already spent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like it's, it's already, done. Yeah. It's, so it is. It, 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 and so to waste weeks on that and that, and the whole whole uh, legislation hostage over it. it I mean, that's 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 for school kids and and. Uh, you know, let's just get get down to what needs to be done. Senator, I mean, if 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 Berkshire were in trouble financially, you know, Charlie and I and everybody else, the directors, we'd sit down and say, you know, we're, we've got to figure out a plan to get out of this, and we'll do it today. Is anything going to happen before this election, gentlemen? Mm, no, uh, you, they, we thought the easiest thing to do would be to restore solvency to Social Security for 75 years. Mm -hmm. All of us, all 18, I thought that at one yeah. point. And Lord's sake, here came the AARP and the senior groups and the Cat Food Commission. I mean, it's just absolutely stupefying. And what we're and we and then we said take the lowest 20 percent and give them 125 percent of poverty. That'll cost some money. Mm -hmm. And give the older old from 80 to 85 a percent kick a year, and do steep keep the progressivity and and raise the wages subject to the tax. We did all that stuff and then get nailed by groups who really, really don't care. They are mark the AARP, I asked their leadership, are they patriots in here or just marketers? Mm. That did not go well that day either. It was just <laughs> one of those days. Yeah. Just yeah. Show you, we, we recommended raising the retirement yeah. age one year, oh, 40, 40 years. years from now. Oh. We wanted to give people a chance to get ready. Right. You know, it's like, you know, Give me a break, you know. I'm for anything 40 years from yeah, now. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I, I mean, as somebody who yeah. could be affected by this, I, I would even take it sooner than that. I'd yeah, say, sure. okay, let me know what I'm getting ready for. Mm -hmm. Tell me what's coming, rather than having a crisis where you look like grease all of a sudden and you got to pull back the promises you've made to people over 40, 50 mm -hmm. years. And what we did is, at the same time, we took care of a truly disadvantaged. We raised the minimum payment to 125 percent of poverty. We gave okay. people between 81 and 86 a 1 percent bump up because that's when every economist, Republican and Democrat, told us their private pension funds generally run out. You know, so we tried to do the kinds of things that really made a difference for people who desperately need Social Security, you know, as that, you know, sounding board for them. And not one person will, will argue with this number that in the year, if you do nothing, in the year 20 and 33, they moved it up three years in one year, you're going to waddle up to the window and get a check for 27 percent less. If and nothing. What, yeah. what is smart yeah. about that, and as I say, when we said raise the retirement age to, to 68 by the year 2050, and the AARP said, how will people ever be able to prepare for that? Well, we said, we think they can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> we just know they can. <laughs> just try to help them do that. Andrew's got another question. Uh, Sorry, Andrew? Hey, guys. Uh, this question, I'll start with Warren, but, but all three gentlemen can jump in. Uh, the president recently proposed extending the Bush era tax cuts uh, for those making less than $250,000. A number of Democrats, including 
uh, Senator Schumer and others have come out and said 250 is the wrong number. It should be a million dollars. Uh, Warren, you have the Buffett rule. Uh, how do you think about this? Well, I, I, am, I am generally in favor of making the, the, uh, the tax code more progressive. Uh, certainly when the most recent figures for the 400 highest incomes in 2009, incomes that averaged $200 million per taxpayer, showed that over half of them paid less than 20 percent in a combination of income taxes and payroll taxes, which means that they, those over half of them paid less than 23 of the 24 people in our office. The only one lower was me. Uh, I, 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 I think there's some changes needed, but I say let's, if they aren't going to do anything, I, I'm for doing that, but, but why, not, why not just solve the problem? I mean, why, why, why just why work around the edges? So I, 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 am, I, I am for what these gentlemen propose. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Gentlemen, what, uh, Sen Senator Simpson and, and, and Mr. Bowles, what, what do you think about those proposals? There's two proposals out. One is to just extend, the Republicans say just extend the Bush tax cuts for another year. The president has laid out his proposal. What's the right solution for right now? Well, between November 6th, when they will do nothing, nothing will be done politically. Nothing will be done between now and November 6th. It's just posturing and guys will get up and say, we can get this terrible thing resolved without touching precious Medicare, precious Medicaid, precious Social Security, and precious defense. Let me tell you, that, that person would be described as a phony that's going to do that in this election. We think, naively enough, that if you have the guts to do something along the lines of what we suggest, the people will reward you. And it won't come now, but in four months, as this thing closes in, man, you know, people are gonna say, hey, if I don't do something, they're gonna throw me out for sitting here doing this BS and mush that I've been pouring out. Can you imagine sitting at Berkshire and you know you have uh, the equivalent of a $7 trillion economic event hitting in December? You know, that if you do nothing, it'll have an adverse effect on the economy of at least one and a half percent next year, which is enough to throw us back into recession. And you're not doing anything? I mean, they say like they can't crazy. do anything in an election year, yeah. but what, why pay them? We ought to pay them just for three years out of four. I bet yeah. they're only going to work three years out of four. <laughs> yeah, of course, we have an election year every two years, too. You know, yeah. so it's like crazy. Andrew, I'm sorry, did I cut you off before? No, no, no. I, I, look, I, I, the, the question I had is I, I completely understand that we have a, a much bigger tax reform and, and reform broadly that we need to get to. And, and I guess I was just trying to understand from, from both gentlemen, um, given where we are and that maybe we won't get any movement, if, if, if the million dollar number, the 250 number, I know, I know, I know it's, it's peanuts on a relative basis to the, the bigger scheme where they come out. Andrew, it's not exactly peanuts no. because the difference between the 250 and uh, the million is about 366 billion dollars, and you know we've got to come up, we got to pay for that some way. You got to come. That's what you know. We're always ready to to reduce to reduce revenue, but we're never willing to to pay for it anyway. I, I really think talking about the Bush tax cuts is almost a waste of time. Mm -hmm. What we should be doing is talking about how do we reform the tax code right. to broaden the base, simplify the code take some small portion to reduce the deficit and take most of it to reduce rates so we'll be globally competitive. That's what makes sense. But that's not gonna happen between November and January, right? No, but what you could do is you could set up a framework between November and January that would call for that. You'd have to have some real specificity, specific what is it? Yeah. Specificity you got, you you know, got and clarity. Erskine, you got a framework. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you fellas worked on it for yeah. 10 months. So that could be set up as yeah. something to say, here's what we will get to. Maybe it doesn't kick in January 1. But. Becky, one of the things we've done is taken that 67-page report that you've read, mm -hmm. and we've now put it in legislative language. Right. Why not have an up and down, or yeah. down vote on it? Yeah. Well, they, anybody, anybody in the past could say, I, I read their 67-page report, but it was a little vague. So if I saw legislative language, I would then get enthused. Well, baby, you got it right now, and that's what they have in front of them. And, and then we say, do what you're supposed to do. If you don't like one, well, take it out, amend something, get in the game. Yeah. So Erskine has pushed that so beautifully. But if you, if you extend the Bush tax cuts just like that, it's between 3.8 trillion and 4.2 trillion in, in 10 years added to the pile. I mean. 
madness. Now you're talking some real money. Yeah. And, and if I had been in, in Congress at that time with what we had to do, and I'm not being a smart aleck, I would never, why would you give a tax cut when you're fighting two wars, borrowing money hand over fist, and give a tax cut? I think the American people, when that came up, were reading their newspapers, say, what's going on? Madness. We're going to continue this conversation in just a moment. So let's get back to Becky in Sun Valley, Idaho, with our special debt reduction summit. Becky, I, 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 was, uh, I came this close to calling it our debt reduction task force. I, I love Jonathan. I oh miss boy. Jonathan Walt, right? <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, yeah. it's really kind of a task force, isn't Something it? stick with us. Yeah. <laughs> it is. This is a supersized task force. This is the mother of all task force, you might say, Joe. Uh, but let's Father jump right back unknown. into well, Let's jump. Oh, I don't know if you heard Senator Simpson. He said father's unknown. But we're going to jump right back into this conversation. And uh, gentlemen, we have already talked an awful lot about what needs to happen with tax reform. That's probably one of the hot button tickets. But uh, as we were just talking off camera here, another thing that you mentioned, Erskine, is that you're very concerned that we need to also be doing about a lot about cutting spending as well. Why don't, why don't you tell us how the plan really would attack that? Yeah, we cut spending by about $3 trillion over the next decade. And again, that's, that gets us to the $4 trillion, which is the minimum amount you have to reduce the deficit in order to stabilize the debt and get it on a downward path as a percent of GDP. You know, and we don't spare anything. I mean, you, you're, the problem is so big right now that, you know, you have, to, you have to make significant cuts in defense. You have to make significant cuts in entitlement programs. You have to make significant cuts in the spending in the tax code if you're going to produce enough deficit reduction to stabilize the debt. What, uh, what's significant? Are we talking 5%, 10%? When, it's just for people to get their heads around what's really coming. It, it, all, all of it is doable, okay? Uh, we spend today about $760 billion a year on defense. Get this one, Mr. No, no, you, you tell well, them because you, know, well, you look. No, yeah. it, 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 this is madness. 750, 760 billion is the USA. And the other countries, major countries of the earth, including Russia and China, combined spend 540 billion. Now, well, the only thing being hollowed out here is your brain. I mean, this is impossible. Think of it again, 750 for us alone, and every other major, all these evil, even, you know, China and Russia, combined 540. There's also a situation which is, you, when you get into this, you see you get savaged. I'm a veteran, I was proud to serve. There is a thing called TRICARE, and it's for military retirees, and give them anything, 2.2 million. There's not a great cohort of them, and some of them have had very little active duty, but they've been in the Guard or the Reserve. They have their own health care plan, and the premium is 470 bucks a year, <laughs> and no copay takes care of all dependents and costs us 53 billion a year. Leon is trying to do something with that, and what's he getting from the professional vet veterans? Getting his head mashed. Here's how crazy defense is. Just think about this. The U.S. has a treaty with oh. Taiwan that will protect Taiwan if they're invaded by the Chinese. There's only one problem with that. We got to borrow the money from China to do it. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's a little tricky yeah. there. Oh, uh, the entitlements are a big part of what we have to focus on. And what we've been trying to do is figure out how we can slow the rate of growth uh, in health care to the rate of growth of, of the economy. The richest uh, country the world has ever seen, $48,000 of GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. Enormous. But, but no matter how rich your family is, you can overpromise. And that's what we've done. And, and you have to get your promises in line with your, with your capacity. And, and, and today, not only are our promises too big, but our outcomes are not so great. You, you take health care. We spend twice as much as any other health care, whether you talk about it as a, on a per capita basis or a percent of GDP. Uh, and, you know, that might be okay if our outcomes were twice as good as anybody else's. But on, outcome, on in, almost any outcome measure you look at, we rank somewhere between 25th and 50th in things like infant mortality and life expectancy and preventable death. And anybody who doesn't think those 50 million people who don't have health care insurance don't get health care, they're crazy. They get health care 
they just get it at the emergency room at five to seven times the cost to be in the doctor's office. And you know who pays for it? We do. We pay for it in higher taxes and higher insurance costs. Well, this brings us to the question of whether the health care plan, the health care law, fixes any of this. We've got to slip in another quick break. We'll come back with that, and I know Joe has a question as well. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll be back with more with the special conversation from Sun Valley right after this. Let's get back to uh, Becky in Sun Valley, Idaho, for some final thoughts uh, from our special guest. Uh, Becky, I, um, can, I, can I just I want to ask your question. Yeah, oh, why don't you jump in? Yeah. Okay, I just want to ask one thing, because we, we frame the, all, a lot of Simpson Bowles talk in the trying to get the 25% government spending and the 15% in, in revenue somewhere. For a while, we were at 18 or 19%, and they kind of matched up, and it, it went along pretty well. So we got to do both, and hopefully, if the economy improves, we won't be at 25%, and the 15% will come up if we don't do anything, but obviously, we do need to act. But yesterday, referencing again this conversation we had with, uh, with Paul Krugman, I kept asking, what is the, the acceptable amount of uh, government spending as a percentage of GDP? Uh, and, and Alan Simpson, or even Warren, I, I got him to, to say that 50 percent uh, was a, in some European countries. Once it gets above 50, he'd have a problem with it. But 50 percent is an 50, five zero. Now, everybody ran with this Crazy. interview. Everybody ran with this interview yesterday because he, used, he said our ideas were zombies and he disparaged all of CNBC and our macroeconomics. No one led with him saying that 50% was an acceptable level. Um, but he also said he, fa he, favor he favors a free market welfare state was, was what he favored. But can you imagine someone saying that 50% is an acceptable level? Run with 21 from this, yeah. from this interview. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, 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 no sounds, higher than 21. No, no higher than 21? Yeah. We can do 21. We can do, we can do 21, and, and, and you know, and there'll be certain years in the future, uh, yeah, because business is cyclical. Uh, you know, when, when it'll go up a little. That's, that's why you have to get it down yeah, there. And it's a little harder now because of the aging of the population to get it to 21. But you can. You got to work at it, but you right. can get it to 21 if you're really serious. But, but 50. You, you would, would there be to, any? To get it. Would there be any negative consequences for 50 percent? <laughs> Yeah. I know it's laughable. It's laughable, and yet it's laughable. And, yet, it's laughable. <laughs> and, and I, I, know, I know. Okay. Can, can I throw one more out there real quick? Uh, yeah. Larry Summers, uh, two weeks ago, wrote an op-ed in the FT. Also came on this broadcast. Talked about uh, the, since since the cost of a loan right now, interest rates are so low, we should move forward huge infrastructure projects. Spend a lot of money now on projects that we would otherwise have to do over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, given what you've been talking about today, I don't know if you got a chance to read that or see what he had to say. What did you think? Look I'm, for, uh, look, I'm for spending the money we spend today more wisely. You know, I, I could give you lots of examples, having run a university, having worked in state government, having worked in the federal government. You know, it's a little bit like this guy who was the, a Nobel Prize winning scientist, you know, who said his Nobel project was running out of money. And he turned to his team and said, hey, we're running out of money. Now we got to start thinking. <laughs> That's what we got to do. Yeah. We're running out of money. We got to start thinking. We got to make tough choices, tough political choices. The way to get to 21 is to get to 21. Right. <laughs> and just do it. We can do it. And the way to and the way to get to 18 and a half or 19 is to get to 18 and a half or 19. I, and and like, you could design a plan. Uh, Joe could design a plan. Uh, most people, everybody would have a, a, a be a, a little unhappy with something, but. It would certainly be better than floating along, you know, like we're doing now. We, we need something done. But the real driver is, is health care, and it doesn't matter what you call it. Forget the Obamacare label, you call it Elvis Presley care. There's nothing in it that has cost containment, not a thing. And people say, well, well it'll happen. Let me tell you, it won't happen, and the reason is very simple. You're going to have pre-existing conditions of a three-year-old that will live to be 60. One person in the United States weighs more than the you got diabetes A and B. You got to do some tort reform. You got to do something with docs. You got to do something 10,000 a day turning 65. Got to make hospitals keep one set of books instead of two. Come on, let's quit fooling each other. This is absolute madness. And this baby is on automatic pilot and will suck up all the discretionary budget of the United States. So I say to people, what do you love? 
well, I love education. I love this. I love that. I love that. Well, pal, that stuff will be wiped out unless you put the screws to this system. We said 400 billion we'd knock off and not let it go up 1% over GD, 1% of GDP a year. No. What, what more can you do? Gentlemen, in the commercial break, you were joking around, and you asked, is there anybody we haven't insulted yet? Uh, anybody left? See, we, we're, we're trying to think of one. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to you. <laughs> if you. If we have not offended you, please write to this. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on a serious note, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the interview that you were looking for 10 million signatories to sign off, to put some pressure on Washington to take these plans very seriously. If someone's involved, if someone's interested in getting involved, what do they need to do? Fixthedebtcampaign.org. That's where we want people to go. That's where we're got our CEO Fiscal Leadership Council, we're bringing in names for people there, but that's what, that's, that, is, that is our social media campaign number that we are going to be launching next week, Fix the Debt, uh, fix, we'll fix the debt campaign the debt org. Fixthedebtcampaign.org. Fixthedebtcampaign.org. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when you look out across everything that's happening, we started this interview, Erskine, and you said that you think we will go off the fiscal cliff? Yeah. What happens at that point? Oh, I think it's. I think it's. I think if they don't, if they don't turn around very quickly and fix it shortly thereafter, then I think it could be really a disaster for the country. It's seven trillion dollars worth of economic events. It's. It'll have an effect of at least one and a half percent decline in GDP next year. You know, it's. That's enough to put us back into recession. And Dick Durbin but, kept asking, we, where's the tipping yeah, point? You, you tell yeah, us where We don't is. have to do it. That's the whole, this is not only the most predictable economic crisis in history, it's the most avoidable if we just come together, put partisanship aside, and pull together. We have about 30 seconds left. And Warren, if you look at this from the market's perspective, if we do go off the fiscal cliff, if we don't, how, how do you uh, weigh no, all I, that well, factor? I, I'm, I'm a huge bull on the country. I mean, this country works over time, and we'll do the right thing in the end. Uh, we just shouldn't wait till the very end. But that, I still think the luckiest person that's ever been born in the world is the baby born in the United States today, and, and I'll stick with that. And I love owning businesses in the United States. We'll invest nine billion dollars almost in the United States at Berkshire this year. So I, I am a bull on America, but I, th I think we have to we have to run it right. That's all. And but we it it. I don't want anybody to get discouraged about how this world is going to turn out because it can be done. I mean, you've got people like this working on it. And, and gentlemen, we can't thank the three of you enough for joining us this morning and you two gentlemen for all your hard work. Uh, Mr. Buffett, Mr. Simpson, Mr. Bowles, thank you very, very much for your time and we hope to check in with you again soon.